So February's NSDA public forum resolution is going to be resolved. The United States federal government should adopt a carbon tax. This is a fairly straightforward topic. We'll look at the wording a little bit, talk about what the topic is not, and then break it down into five major areas of arguments that both teams are probably going to want to consider. So for starters, it's a question of if. It's not a question of when. It's not a question of what the tax should be. It's not a question of is it politically feasible. It's not a question of what rate. It's not asking what else could be better. Rather, what would happen without it. So in addition to this, it's really not a question of what else. It might be a question of mutual exclusivity, but it's probably not going to be that either. So let's go ahead and look at some of the words. So federal government probably refers to all three branches, so it really only takes the action of one. Theoretically, this would be a tax, so Congress would levy it, the executive branch would enforce it, and the judicial branch would really just stay out of the way and let it be considered constitutional. And there are certainly arguments that could be made about maybe one branch acting better, but the resolution doesn't say all the federal government. It simply asks if it should be a federal actor as opposed to a non-federal actor. I don't think ASPEC, OSPEC from policy debate are really going to make major appearances here. So what do we mean by a carbon tax? I mean, you can try to define it as a tax on anything containing the element carbon, but you're going to be really short on literature and your judges are probably going to laugh at you as they vote against you. So really the only predictable literature-based definition here is a tax on CO2 emissions. Now this could be a tax placed on individual households, this could be a tax placed on corporations, this could be a tax placed on goods that cause the emissions or goods that will produce the emissions. There's a few different ways it could be done and a few different places that have done it in the past that can be looked at for examples. We'll get into that later on. Really though, it's a tax, the goal of which is to reduce carbon emissions, to modify the economic incentive structures. So basically, we're attempting to reduce the use of CO2 by making CO2 more expensive than the alternatives, making alternative energy less expensive than using the previously cheaper but more polluting method plus the tax. So the idea might be, for instance, a reduced incentive to produce greenhouse gases. Though, again, the tax is not on greenhouse gases in general, it's specifically on CO2, which could become important later in some rounds. This also doesn't mean that there can't be other subsidies offered. There are subsidies offered on a lot of types of green energy in the status quo. This would simply be a disincentive to using the dirtier kind of energy that could be combined with or act independently of various incentives to use cleaner energies. So let's look at the big areas. And I think the big five really are going to be climate, politics, governance, competitiveness, and implementation. And we're going to break these down in a little more depth. So when we're talking about climate, we're asking, well, first off, just how is this going to affect global warming? How is this going to affect climate change? How is this going to affect climate disruption? And neither team needs to take a stance on this, but both teams have arguments they can make on this. So it's pretty intuitive. If you're looking for big impacts on pros, this is one of the areas you might want to talk about. Both sides, when talking about this, want to be clear on what kind of climate change they think is going to happen, what effect CO2 has on that, how close we are to a brink or tipping point of that effect, whether it's reversible now, whether it's reversible after that, and what the tax could possibly do about that. So you don't necessarily want to overstate your impacts if you go for a climate argument on pro because you can easily take yourself past the point of no return or something minor like economic incentives 
would have any luck of solving in just the U.S. rather than a total ban or an international effort. So you want to have a big impact, but you also want to be able to show that every little bit helps and that minor economic incentives easing along are the way to go. And that's hard to do if you just go for the big warming extinction scenarios that are pervasive in other forms of debate. So you want to be careful to show that we are still at a point where this is manageable with sensible economic policy. And of course, that's if you're choosing to argue that it is evitable. If you're arguing that it is inevitable, then the argument changes slightly. At that point, you are saying there are certain inevitable costs to mitigation or adaptation to what is going to happen to our climate. We think that most of those costs should be paid through a tax on the people causing these costs to exist in the first place. That's a different kind of argument. You're no longer preventing so much as saying, given that these costs are inevitable, and given that these costs come from tax money regardless, we think that rather spreading it equally, people who pollute more should pay more of the costs of pollution. And it's not as flashy of an argument, but it's probably an easier one to get some offense on as pro without worrying about uniqueness problems. So when we're talking about climate, pro is arguing there are real problems that exist, con is arguing the threat is overrated, or that the tax won't mitigate the threat, or that the tax will, through hurting the economy or through hurting innovation, stop adaptation efforts in the long term. Next big area to look at is going to be politics. And I'm separating politics out from governance here because in politics, I'm talking more about the political implementations of this, political ramifications of this. Again, we're not saying necessarily who will implement the tax or who will get credit for it or what exactly it will be, but we can make some assumptions about how people will react to it. A carbon tax in Australia, for instance, did succeed in reducing per capita emissions for the first and only time in Australia's history, but it also got the government that put the tax into place voted out of office very quickly and replaced by a government which rolled back all of their policies and then some. So when you're looking at how Gillard transitioned to Abbott, you're also looking at very similar analogies in the U.S. Much like the U.S., Australia had a very strong entrenched fossil fuel industry with lobbyists who wielded a lot of power in the subsequent elections. The idea that by doing this, we would cause a political backlash which would undermine more important environmental programs is certainly something that can be used. And this kind of overlaps with what we normally call a politics disad and policy debate, but it doesn't necessarily need to be based on political capital. It certainly can be, but the resolution doesn't mandate whose political capital gets spent to implement the tax in the first place, or that one party takes credit, one party takes blame. The pro could theoretically defend a bipartisan carbon tax ought be passed and say that most of Khan's standard politics disads transported over and roughly translated into public forum are just going to be reasons that it should be done bipartisan instead of done by one party, but that it is still a good idea and should be adopted and therefore the resolution is true. Con teams have to get a little bit smarter if they want to run politics scenarios. It has to be talking more about, regardless of who does this, this is what the backlash from the voters will look like. This is what the backlash from special interests will look like. It doesn't matter who proposes it, it doesn't matter who votes for it, this is what there will be a lack of willingness to do afterwards. This is what will probably get rolled back as a result. These will be the effects on the EPA. These will be the effects in 2016 elections. There are a lot of different ways that a con team can go with this if they want, but they definitely do need to focus on the political consequences of everyday Americans reacting to having to pay a carbon tax rather than reacting to, well, you fiat party X passes it, so we say that party Y will do this in response, and that leads to Z. Keep it simple. Focus on why this makes the idea of a carbon tax being adopted undesirable if you choose to talk about it that way. 
of course, Pro can also gain offense here. Not necessarily the standard offense ported over policy or LD of winners win, political capital begets more political capital, but more just in terms of these are the good political reactions that we can get from this, and they can use examples of the carbon tax in Canada as their success story, whereas Australia would be using it as probably more of a con example. They could also talk about carbon tax in other parts of the world, in individual counties or cities in the United States and build off of that. But you could certainly use political momentum gained domestically or internationally as a pro argument as well. That said, I don't think it's one of pro's strongest contentions, but it is a turn that pro should be willing to explore if Khan wants to talk about the political ramifications of adoption. The third category is going to be governance. And I'm separating governance from politics because this is more about theory than about results. So this is more about what the role of a government is, how a government ought to act. Is it a government's role to manipulate the market in this way? Would it be better for the government to incentivize instead of punish? Should it reward clean energy instead of taxing people for using what are the most affordable things to use right now? There are many arguments to be made about this approach is regressive. It'll hurt the people who can't afford anything except the cheapest, dirtiest ways of doing things, and will reward people for being rich, for being able to afford energy-saving stuff in the long term, because the people who can afford to drive Tesla need another tax break, and the people who are piecing together their old emissions test failing car that they've been using for the past 25 years really need something else to pay. So, in addition to being regressive, it's just a question of basically carrot versus stick. Is the government better off attempting to do this through giving rewards, or is it by punishing people for taking actions that would otherwise make economic sense? The other aspect of governance is just questions of who the actor should actually be. Remember, the resolution says the federal government. If this is something that should be done on a state-by-state -state level, if this is something that should be done on an international level, if this is something that should be done through the private sector rather than through the federal government, these are all questions of governance. These are all questions of all into this third category. Federalism arguments are probably one of the two biggest categories here, the other being just carrot versus stick and what that means in terms of progressive versus regressive taxes. Again, much like the September-October topic, Pro's answer to a lot of this stuff is that the evidence that Khan is reading is prescriptive rather than prohibitive. That it is not an argument against having a carbon tax, it is an argument for a cap on the carbon tax, for what kind of carbon tax we shouldn't have, for who should be exempt from it, or for different ways not to do it, but not an argument against the idea of taxing carbon. So that's where a lot of the clash on that goes. The next category that could come up is competitiveness. And competitiveness is a broad category, it is looking at what will this do for innovation? What will this do for industry? What will this do for employment? What will this do for the general strength of the United States economy, both within itself and in relation to other countries? The con line on competitiveness is that anti-business policies kill competitiveness it encourages people to simply take their business elsewhere where they can pollute cheaply rather than here where they have to either pay large taxes for the same kind of business or where they have to switch over to a more expensive and impractical form of energy because of the government's social engineering. Generally speaking, this is going to make arguments about carbon leakage, this is going to make arguments about capital flight, this is going to make arguments about offshoring companies, and that's where the con side wants to go on competitiveness. The pro side, when talking about competitiveness, probably wants to focus a lot more on what this will do for energy leadership, what this will do for other countries' collective action problems, particularly in light of the Paris Summit, and how the U.S. taking a role is going to allow other people to feel like it's no longer a tragedy of the commons, but this is a situation where they can actually make a difference if they join in as well. You can all struggle with competitiveness in terms of spurring innovation, in terms of 
Yes, you're going to lose out on some sectors of the economy, but you're going to get other sectors of the economy developed even better. And the way that this can also be spun is, let's say the con team is right about everything they're saying about warming. If that's true, then we've just created green jobs, increased the sustainability, reduced air pollution, reduced our dependence on coal, reduced our dependence on foreign oil, and become a world leader in green technology all for nothing. Oh well. These are all things that can be independent benefits of themselves. And again, the idea that restrictions are bad for competitiveness is not self-evident gospel. It is a prevailing economic theory in some schools of economics. But at the same time, certain kinds of restrictions are going to channel creativity or focus creativity rather than eliminating it altogether. I'm not going to say that, for instance, if I was talking about poetry, that a sonnet or a haiku has to be less creative than blank verse just because it has rigid structures that has to fall within. If you want to develop a lot of creativity in a fairly narrow subset, creating rules around that is the way to go. And that's the mindset that Pro wants to have pushing forward on competitiveness. These are the areas that it matters to be competitive in, and we control the internal link to them. The last question is a question of implementation. And this is a question partly of mutual exclusivity and partly just a question of probable versus optimal. Both sides want evidence describing what a carbon tax would probably be like, and both sides want to point out the other side has seen this evidence and they will take it into account when deciding what kind of carbon tax to implement. Khan is going to say, well, the government has read these policy papers. The people who are proposing this, they'll use their model, and here's why their model is bad. But these are the people who the government will let write the tax, will let write the laws. Pro is going to say, all these objections. The politicians can read them. Their clerks can read them. They can adapt to these. These are not reasons to not have a carbon tax. These are reasons to do it intelligently. So implementation is largely a question of what can con advocate, and is it mutually exclusive? So cap and trade can be done with a carbon tax. If Com wants to advocate for cap and trade, then it show it's going to happen in the status quo and how it happening with a carbon tax is worse than it happening on its own. Basically, any alternative solution that Con wants to propose, they need to either show that it and a carbon tax cannot happen together or that it happening without a carbon tax is substantially better than it happening with a carbon tax because the carbon tax undermines a better solution that rather than just being purely hypothetical and needing fiat is a better solution that is going to naturally happen in the status quo or is happening already and that is going to be shortchanged by this policy. So this is a question of implementations that the different sides want to look. I think this is a fairly balanced topic. I think that both sides have a decent array of arguments to pick from. I think that generally speaking, Pro has an easier time of framing out con arguments from the round, but con has a greater diversity of arguments they can pick from and more angles they can approach the topic from. I think that speaking second on this topic is probably more important than which side you get. I think good teams can do just fine on either side of this topic. Overall, Khan probably wants to have a couple different ways to win the round. Pro probably wants to try and collapse down to a couple big ideas regardless of what individual contentions they come to. Generally speaking, I think you'll see con teams moving around a little bit more and pro teams staking their ground fairly early in the round, trying to stick with one big narrative while con teams just basically test the waters and see, okay, where is this pro team weak? Which area of this topic do we think that we want to focus on? but you'll see more options for con teams and a greater diversity of con final focuses at the end of most rounds of this topic than you will pro. I think pro is pretty much going to be sticking to a couple big core ideas and collapsing down to things that are bigger than any one contention. If you have any questions on this, certainly feel free to leave them in the comments or send me a message. This is going to be an important topic for a bunch of big tournaments. Harvard, Berkeley, UPenn, Georgetown, the Associated Round Robins. It's going to be a busy month. It's going to be some people's national qualifiers, some people's state championships. And frankly, it's a pretty good topic for that because it's balanced enough that the better team is going to win most of the time. If you have questions, let me know. I'll try and do a follow-up. 
Otherwise, best of luck debating the topic.